Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this red gamingtech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with a supposed leak benchmark using CPU-Z, focusing on single-threaded performance for Comet Lake, Sunny Cove architecture, in other words, Ice Lake, and AMD's Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. Now this popped up on several different Chinese websites, including Beidou, but I have to say I'm extremely skeptical of the uh, legitimacy of these results. So we're going to go quickly through the results, and then I'm going to say why I'm actually very skeptical of the performance, and then we're going to move over to a lot more, uh, a lot cooler news. So, so the first thing that's good about these results is that we have several different processors that we know how they would score. For example, the 2700X, and we have an 8700K, and we have a 9900K, and so on and so on. Those are obviously CPUs that, if they are clocked appropriately with a reasonable system configuration, in other words, they're not using ridiculously slow RAM with really, really, really loose timings, they're going to score roughly these results. That's great. That gives us a point of reference that is roughly what you would expect. And then you've got CPUs such as Comet Lake, which is listed here as 8-core, eight 8-thread. Eight now, I have to say, I don't work in Intel's marketing department, and I don't know how they're going to break down the Comet Lake SKUs, but I would not be surprised if we don't see that type of uh, SKU from Intel, at least for the higher-end parts. I think that they're going to want to retain hyper-threading on as many of the higher-end SKUs as possible, simply because of Matisse. I mean, I don't work at Intel, but that's what I would do, because they're already being beaten in core count. I would want as many darn threads as humanly possible. But let's just take that at face value for a moment and say that the 8-core, eight 8-thread eight Comet Lake processor at 5200 MHz is roughly on par with a 9700K. That I can get behind. We don't think that there's major architectural changes for Comet Lake. They are basically still using the... Um, Skylake architecture. There may be a few changes here and there, like a better memory controller, maybe higher clock frequencies, maybe a few uh, other bits and bobs, but generally it is going to be pretty much the same core. That result I can definitely get behind. I can maybe even get behind the 3800X, because it's running at 4700 megahertz here, and the single thread performance is 635. Given what we know about IPC games from AMD, I could say, okay, that's within the realms of acceptability. But then you have results such as the Sunny Cove Core i7 1065G7. That name is just so simple and easy to remember. I like it. Anyway, it's a 4-core 8-thread processor. We know this. It's running at 3700 MHz. But here's the thing. Its single-thread performance is 639 points. That's a lot of points. It, it actually beats out the 3800X, despite this 1000 megahertz difference in clock speed, and actually beats out the 7700K, and is basically identical in single thread performance to the 9700K, as well as the ES uh, Comet Lake processor. So we're not looking at like, you know, 10 or 20 or 30% improvement here, uh, the same clock frequency, we're looking at way over 40%, which is considerably more than what Intel have actually said that they are targeting for the Sunny Cove architecture. They're saying that there's going to be an 18% an 18 excuse me, uh, IPC. So is there any chance that these results are legitimate? Well, obviously, it's very, very, very slightly possible, but it's within the realms of like uh, half a percent or so that these are legitimate. Not only would the individual need to have Comet Lake processors and Ice Lake processors, as well as Matisse processors, to be able to get these results. They would also need to then have uh, a result which, for, for the Ice Lake processors, um, way over what Intel themselves are predicting the IPC performance is going to be, a, a, a gain. Now, in fairness, this isn't the first time that we've seen some weirdness with CPU-Z. When Ryzen 1000, so when Zen first debuted, actually they changed the way that the benchmark worked for, I think it was 1.79, I believe it was 1.79, because basically Ryzen processors 
were just scoring abnormally high compared to their Intel counterparts, and it's not for any other reason other than the benchmark just happened to function in a way that uh, they didn't anticipate on Ryzen CPUs, so they had to change the way the actual uh, benchmark functioned. So it's possible, therefore, that that's what we're seeing here with Ice Lake, and it just so happens that that's causing these abnormally high results. But given all of the other stars that would need to align to make this work, I just don't believe this is just messy at all. So I think that we can pretty much safely say that these benchmarks are completely fake. But what isn't completely fake, though, is a couple of pieces of AMD noobs. The first of which is actually from LLVM, and it would appear that we have a couple of additional code names for Narve. So what we do know is that, of course, Narve is using GFX10 for its uh, code name. So GFX10 and Narve will be launching with the 5700 series and the 5700 XT, which will be, of course, targeting both the 2060 and the 2070 from NVIDIA. But there's also a lot of wiggle room from AMD to release different SKUs. So what we have on uh, the LLVM website is actually a couple of additional code names. Unfortunately, what they don't do is really tell us that much about the architecture itself. We do know it's a discrete GPU, so it is not an APU. So at least that's something, I suppose. But when it comes to instruction sets and all that stuff, it's all to be agreed. It's still using the same wave front size of 64, that's not really surprising, but we have GFX 1011 and finally GFX 1012. Just as a quick reminder, higher numbers do not equate to higher performance GPUs. They are actually usually in the order of design. So sometimes, for example, you can have a higher name, uh, higher uh, codename GPU, for example, uh, with GP106, and it will be a lower performance than GP104 or GP102 from NVIDIA, and AMD do much the same thing. So it's probable that these are lower-end SKUs that we will be seeing launch later on. How much later on, we can only guess, but at least we know that AMD are working on them, even though we don't know what the performance targets or specifications are going to be yet. Keeping on track with AMD news, we also have an update concerning B550 and A520. As we all know, Ryzen 3000 is going to be launching on the 7th of July this year, but that is only with the X570 motherboards, which will bring numerous improvements, including, of course, the primary one, PCIe 4. The good news is that you can also use Ryzen 3000 CPUs with older motherboards, and you won't incur a performance penalty. You won't get PCIe 4, but other than that, essentially, the processes will work identically. It'll be interesting to see exactly what overclocking is like and things such as 3950X on cheaper motherboards, like what's going to happen in terms of stability. But pretty much, you will be good to go. But there are also a number of people who are also interested in purchasing a B450 motherboard. And it would appear, thanks to a report from DigiTimes, that we will not be getting these motherboards this year. As media will be providing the chipset for both the 550 and A520, and it will be taping out the uh, chipsets, and they will be basically on track to be sent to motherboard manufacturers by the end of this year, so pretty much late Q4. So most likely, given manufacturing and lead times, this will mean that motherboards themselves won't start to appear on shelves until at least let's say the first quarter of this year, because obviously not only do they need to start doing internal testing and tweaking and, you know, design of the boards, but then they actually need manufacturing time. So what we do understand about this chipset so far, according to G Digi Times, excuse me, is we have uh, PCI Express for downstream lanes, but the boards themselves will be built to AMD's PCB requirements, so that we have a PCIe 4 points times 4.0 times 16 slot for discrete graphics and we also have improvements in VRM design and so on and so on. So theoretically we will still get improvements in let's say memory overclocking compared to the previous generation platforms. Unfortunately though uh, because we're going to have to wait until next year for these motherboards to appear on store shelves that basically means that you can use the older generation motherboards in the short term or you can cough up the cash and pick up one of the more expensive 
X570 boards. Now we have a couple of pieces of next generation console news, the first of which comes to us from Michael Pachter, who is of course a very well known analyst over at Wedbush. So he predicts that the next generation of consoles is going to cost you $399.99, or 400 bucks. let's just call it that. Honestly, this is like the safest bet in terms of a price prediction, because when it starts to get more expensive, like let's say 450 to 500 US dollars, it's an awful lot to ask someone to buy into the next console generation. But then it does depend on what we see. Um, we heard suspiciously little from Microsoft regarding the lower end Xbox SKU. Remember, we've heard that there's going to be Anaconda and also Lockhart, with Lockhart being the lower end and Anaconda being the higher end uh, uh, console. And then you have Sony, who basically are probably only going with one PlayStation 5 SKU. So I'm going to guess that Sony are most likely going to want to target like 400 bucks. Um, maybe a little more, maybe 429 or something like that, but they're probably not going to want to price it super, super, super high. They, I think they learned a lot of lessons with the PS3 pricing. It's Microsoft, though, I guess it depends on what strategy they're going to go with. I personally don't think they've abandoned the two Xbox approach. I just think that that's what they want to do. But, you know, hearing things through the grapevine, not, developers don't necessarily want that at the start of a new console generation. So maybe they might postpone the idea of releasing a lower end or a higher end SKU, in which case it may force them to go with like just one Xbox console and then target it at like 400 bucks. But personally, I think we're going to see one from Microsoft at around the $250 mark and one probably around the 450 to 500 US dollar mark. So obviously, if you're predicting like 400 bucks for the next generation consoles, it's a pretty safe bet. No matter how staunch of a critic you might have been with Microsoft and the Xbox for this generation, you have to give them credit for one thing, and that is that the backwards compatibility for the Xbox One is really amazing. You have original Xbox games as well as Xbox 360 games that will run on the Xbox One, and the team have now made over 600 titles backwards compatible, which is it's actually quite the number. But they're no longer going to be working on bringing titles to the Xbox One with backwards compatibility. So why is that? Well, it's very simple, and that is that the team are now going to be working on Project Scarlet. So that means that we will have three generations of legacy Xbox consoles that the team will be hoping to bring to Project Scarlet. And it's really interesting because it feels like A, <laughs> it shouldn't be three generations of legacy consoles by now. I don't know where the heck that time went. And it's also going to be rather interesting on how they're going to be doing this. Because we've heard a lot of things regarding the specifications of the next generation Xbox. But what we do know is it's going to be using a Zen 2 processor, Narbo based GPU. So they can pretty much brute force, I imagine, the original Xbox without any problems at all. And they can probably even brute force to a degree the... Uh, Xbox 360, although obviously it is a power PC based architecture, so... For the Xbox One titles though, they may choose a more PlayStation-like approach, and that is spoofing the uh, Xbox One hardware. With uh, Sony, the PlayStation 5 basically spoofs how the CPU and other components of the PS4 operate, and basically you have things such as the CPU running at lower clock frequencies, or the GPU running with fewer cores, or whatever they need to do to make the system work. So it's going to be really interesting if they decide to do that same thing for the Xbox, and exactly what's going to be happening in terms of improvements, like are we going to see uh, higher visual quality for those games, are we going to see more stable frame rates, and what's going to happen. I have to say that the uh, backwards compatibility team over at Microsoft are really awesome and talented, so I'm going to be very curious to see exactly what uh, they managed to achieve with a uh, vastly upgraded hardware. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, then you know what to do. You can like the video. Uh, you can also subscribe to the channel and, well, click the bell icon because apparently, as we all know, subscribing now is not enough. And I'll see you soon. Take care, yourselves. Bye for now.